Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning once again. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. I know it's Monday morning. I know it's not necessarily the best day of the week. Um, however, this is happening. Uh, this morning, uh, we are here to talk about a wonderful survey that's coming out that's inclusive of Caribbean folks, for Caribbean folks, LGBT persons. Um, what is the cost of exclusion? How do countries actually view this? Um, where do they see the, eco, the socioeconomic costs against development, or do they even see that at all? Um, and when people don't necessarily see LGBT citizens as citizens who actually contrib contribute to a nation, um, what does that do in relation to data, but also standards and loss of human resources? So I think when I think about this survey, there are a number of things I think about. One is, as a citizen, how are you really counted? Are you seen as a citizen of the country? Um, where does that lie? Um, and because of your sexual orientation or gender identity, does it then make you less human? Today, I'm happy to see that uh, the Eastern Caribbean Alliance for Diversity and Equality has been part of a advisory group working with um, Open for Business in figuring out some of those questions in figuring out just how to go about this. But we didn't stand alone. Um, we stood with persons across the Caribbean from different islands. And today you're gonna hear from some of them um, just talking about um, the importance of this survey at this time, um, understanding just why they think it's important and now it's even more relevant than before. Um, I think that uh, as we go through the survey, one of the things I've taken the opportunity to do is already share the links right here in the chat and it will be um, also shared on uh, Facebook also. I believe that uh, as we uh, go through this conversation, it gives you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, my name is Kenita Placid. I'm based here in Sinusha, and you'll be hearing from Caleb based in uh, Belize, uh, Alex uh, Alexis based in Bahamas, and Simone based in Jamaica. Um, once again, thank you and welcome. Right now, I'll pass the mic over to Caleb, um, who will take us through. No, actually, Caleb, I think you should go last. Let me think about that. <laughs> I think uh, from one regional group to the next, um, it would be good to hear from uh, United Caribbean Trans Advocacy, um, a group, UC Trans, and hear a little from the executive director and one of the persons who actually pushed trans visibility for quite a few years, even before UC Trans was given birth to. Alexis DeMarco. Can you hear me? Okay, let's press off me. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this early morning session. Like it's Monday morning, but we have to get the work done. So let's start off. Um, I think this is a great opportunity, especially with Open for Business, <clears throat> for the visibility of trans communities which were normally left behind in data collection. Some of the questions being asked on the survey will capture some data that is long missing from the Caribbean region. And due to COVID-19, some of the information that's needed is very pertinent, especially as it relates to um, Caribbean persons. As you know, the Bahamas is a tourist destination. And us being a part of this survey and us being a part of Open for Business to see exactly how many persons, how do people feel when they visit our countries? How people feel when communities are left behind, the very communities that should be um, taken care of. So for me and UC Trans, I think it's a great way and it's an opportunity to collect data um, to find out more information and who is in our country, who is in our Caribbean region, what were some of the issues that they were facing living in country? Even those in the, in the diaspora would have access to this information. And if you would look at some of the questions being asked, you would see some of that information being captured for those persons living in, that, in the diaspora. And many of our trans communities have already started and have been relocating 
to different countries around the world. So I think pushing this survey out to those in the diaspora will be also important to us. But as a trans movement in the Caribbean region, this is a part of our work and collaboration is a part of our work to ensure that we get the maximum um, resources, the maximum help, the, the, the building of our capacity in our organization and for our trans communities. So at this time, I'd like to thank Open for Business for including trans communities as a part of this project. Kenita? Thank you so very much. I was actually trying to find where the page disappeared. So, um, right about now, we go over to Simone Harris from Jamaica um, for a few weeks. Thanks, Kenita. Morning again, everyone. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Phil. <laughs> uh, so I'm Simone Harris from um, based in Kingston. I'm from Jamaica. I'm based in Kingston, Jamaica. I uh, want to thank the organizers for including such a diverse, bringing together such a diverse group of people from across the region. Not often that I have the opportunity to sit with amazing people like you um, in one meeting. So thank you for that. My uh, words of contribution to the dialogue this morning, you know, I second what Alexis said, especially the point on tourism. I think this study, it's, it's absolutely timely. It is data that has been needed for a long time. In Jamaica, uh, in 2017, we started the Jamaica Association of Diverse Businesses to capture data like this to uh, lobby from an economic perspective for businesses owned and operated by LGBTQ people. And it really, really, really was an uphill battle. But to see, but perhaps we needed more soldiers, more lieutenants. And so this approach definitely welcoming. Um, I don't think there is a country on the planet right now that has um, gone unscathed from the economic fallout of COVID-19. And in, here in the Caribbean, where the majority of the countries here are tourism dependent, that is going to mean um, significant work from leadership. It's an opportunity for us as a community, but I believe it's also an opportunity for government to now uh, look at this study, look at the output and take the information seriously as they make different decisions about how to take care of um, citizens. It's giving us all a voice. We are uh, nationals of our, of our countries contributing to growth and development in, in many different ways. And I think this study will um, provide an opportunity to show the numbers associated with that and take us to uh, another step in this process as we move towards equality and um, diversity and inclusion across the region. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I think as you have heard, coming from uh, three different perspectives, but feeling that information is very, very much key to some of the arguments that are being put forth. Um, it will also see divine intervention in terms of additional advocacy. And, you know, the excuses government always have around not necessarily having data to support um, what we are saying. I guess I'd like to see how they react to this data. Um, and I know this is not just about us here in the region, um, leaving in those countries, but this research is actually looking to also hear the voices of persons who have left, persons who are in the diaspora. And so whether you are in Europe, in UK, um, in Canada, in the US, this is also something for you. So I really hope that persons here would show, share this survey, not just in country, but also with those countrymen who now reside overseas. Um, right about now, we'll ask Phil to take us through a little more in depth in the different aspects of the uh, research and some of the thinking behind the qualitative answers we expect to see or 
maybe it might be different, but just take us through it. Let people understand what they'd be sharing with people. And uh, folks, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Put it in the chat, raise your hands. One of the co-hosts will call or bring it to the attention of whoever is speaking at the moment. Thank you. Phil, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Kenita and Alexis and Simone. Uh, my name is Phil Crehan. I work with Open for Business um, and with these organizations and many others across the region. Um, we have built this survey um, and we're le really leading this research to measure the socioeconomic impact of homophobia, transphobia, what is the cost of LGBT exclusion? And likewise, what is the added benefit when there is LGBT inclusion? Um, so I will say, uh, I get, just give a shout out to Catherine Dovey and Liam Rezend, who are Open for Business colleagues who are on the call right now. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess before jumping in, I really um, piggyback on the ideas that Kenita, Simone, uh, Alexis, built on which is the strength of data and and our lgbt people really counted in their countries and when we look all over the planet when we look in every country no they're not lgbt people are left off of all sorts of data collection mechanisms all sorts of diagnostics as um as dr lee badgett says no country is can can be considered developed when it comes to lgbt inclusion and rights we're all developing and this is um, having the data that can promote the interventions from our governments, from the private sector are sorely missing. And we're really missing out there. When we look at, in my opinion, when we look at a lot of advocacy efforts across the world, we're, we really need to lean into this idea that data collection, particularly quantitative data, but also qualitative data is really, has to be there to showcase that we are a significant part of the population that we have significant challenges, but also that we bring significant contributions, that we're meaningfully a part of our societies, we're meaningfully part of our economies, and we're meaningfully part of our political systems. So it's really exciting for me as a researcher to be part of such an um, incredible and, and large data collection effort that can really bring light to the serious issues that, that our communities struggle with. Um, so I would say the research itself, maybe before I jump into that, I'll say open for business. What is open for business? It's a um, charity. It's a coalition of um, many multinational corporations who came together that said, we want to be much more active on LGBT issues, not only in the workplace, but also in the country context that we work. But to do so, they really needed the justification why to work on these issues was part and parcel to the business, their business interests, but also to an economic interest. So Open for Business said, let's provide this data-driven case why LGBT inclusion and LGBT rights are so connected to business and economic outcomes. And they've done that the world over um, with a number of uh, global diagnostics that really utilizes pre-existing data to say, of course, LGBT rights are connected to business and economic outcomes. More recently, they did this in Kenya with, um, by first and foremost saying there is an economic cost to LGBT exclusion and that tallies to around $1.3 billion of GDP per year. So that's a significant loss. That's around 1% of GDP around that. Um, and the strength of that is that there is an articulated human rights approach to this and in tandem with this, now in Kenya, they have this economic costing exercise, which really gets the attention of the private sector, of certain ministries in the government who have never before been activated to work on LGBT inclusion. So this new economic pathway is really strong. And what that has led to is our colleague, um, she has convened the many corporations in the private sector to adopt a non-discrimination policy, first ever in the country, it's just such an incredible example of how when we um, build this socioeconomic case, we can use it to activate those who have never quite been activated before to promote rights, to promote inclusion. It's just another way to really meaningfully work on the issues that we work with um, by really pulling in the data-driven case. So turning to the Caribbean, um, this is something, there are two uh, regional case studies now. One is in the English-speaking Caribbean and the other is in Eastern Europe. And with the support of Virgin Atlantic in the Caribbean, they said, can we meaningfully estimate the economic cost of LGBT exclusion? And we said, yes, we absolutely can, but we need to first and foremost collect more data because there are so many data gaps. 
and um, working with a number of organizations on this call and, and some others, we've identified those most pressing gaps and, and have developed two surveys that really speak to um, how to generate those, those data and how to generate those knowledge. So the survey that we're talking about today, which is answer change, that's, that's our hashtag, that's our social media, um, really that's trying to get to the LGBT community in 12 English speaking Caribbean countries, as well as the LGBT Caribbean diaspora, predominantly in the US, UK and Canada. And what we're trying to do with this is say, um, what are the challenges when it comes to your experience of um, potential discrimination in education, in school, in healthcare, when applying for work? This is a really big one because what we really need are quantitative data that showcase that there is in fact an occupational segregation going on that pushes people away from the formal sector and into the informal sector. Anecdotally, we know this is the case, but we need to quantify it. Uh, quantitatively capture that. So again, the survey is looking at experience of exclusion and discrimination in education, healthcare, employment, really which together speaks to losses of human capital and losses of labor output. In addition to those two themes, those two sectors, a couple other big ones we're looking at is the potential LGBT brain drain. So anecdotally, we know that by virtue of some laws or stigma, Many LGBT people are incentivized to leave the country, leave the region. And the question is, is there a loss to the region when people leave? And how do we better capture the specific push factors of a law and stigma? This is something that we're really keen to do with the survey. And it's something that has never quite been done in the LGBT space. So again, as Kinita said, please do send this to your networks um, in the diaspora, wherever they may be. So aside from that, uh, one last big thing we're looking at, and a few have already mentioned this, is the impact of tourism. Tourism is a large part of many GDPs in the country, in the region. Um, and we're really trying to see with another survey that is also out there, um, do is the perception of the Caribbean for prospective tourists, um, does that have an impact on how they come to the region by virtue of laws, by virtue of stigma? Does that have a relationship to how potential tourists are deciding to go to countries in the, re in the region? Um, some interesting things there, of course, we know that Caleb, who is about to speak next um, in Belize has led the case against decrim. Um, this has also been the case in Trinidad and also Bahamas. So there is a way in which with this tourism survey, we can capture differentials between the three that do not criminalize versus the nine that do have these laws on the books, there's a way to, to kind of capture potential experiences of tourists coming to the region. So that's a lot to throw at you. I hope it's um, I hope it's a breakdown. I want to turn it over to my colleague Liam, who is doing a lot of work with the interviews, because one of the big parts of this is capturing the experiences of business leaders and what it is for them to work with the LGBT community. How are they getting over this occupational segregation? How are they better working with the community so that they have socioeconomic empowerment and livelihoods? So Liam, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> hopefully many of you would be able to uh, realize that I'm from Trinidad. Um, I have been living in, um, in London for about 10 years now, um, but Really, really excited to be to be working on this project with Phil and Catherine, the Open for Business team. Um, and you know, many of you have already expressed the the importance and the reason behind um, why this is so important. So I thought I'll just touch a little bit on, as Phil mentioned, the 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 business interviews and and, and really understanding the sort of capturing the qualitative side. Um, what we are doing is uh, alongside the the surveys that Phil mentioned is we are interviewing. Um, a cross-section of business leaders across the Caribbean and, and really looking at the diversity of, of business leaders from multinational corporations to uh, local organizations to companies uh, across various different sectors, whether it be energy, banking, um, tourism, professional services, um, and really asking them, you know, many, many different questions around, you know, whether they have you know inclusion and diversity strategies that exist within their within their organizations how are they attracting and retaining lgbt staff um, are they actively going out uh, looking for lgbt staff um, how do they develop their policies to ensure that they to, to ensure that they're inclusive um, one thing that's that's really sort of um 
you know, um, I, what, what I'm really happy to, to sort of hear from the, you know, 20, 15 to 20 odd uh, interviews that we've had so far is, you know, we've heard from the civil society, we've heard from, from activists within the region, and we've heard from, from governments how important this data is. But what was really re rewarding was to hear how much this data is needed within the business sector as well. Um, you know, we, we're, we've been interviewing CEOs, vice presidents of human resources, uh, you know, managers, or people that work throughout organizations, both LGBT and non-LGBT, uh, to really start to, to build a picture of, um, of, of why, this, why this research uh, is important. You know, research shows that the more some the, the more someone the more inclusive an organization is, you know, the more the better they perform, the better the more profitable the organizations are. Um, so it's really just being able to 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 have this data that is uh, specific to the Caribbean, specific to the English speaking Caribbean, um, to really help us continue to drive change uh, within the organization within within the region. Um, so very, very, very excited. Uh, we're continuing to, uh, to, to conduct these interviews. I, I recommend if you have uh, any recommendations of any business leaders within your, within your countries that, that you'd like Phil or I to, to speak to, please do share that as well. Um, but again, just want to impress the importance of uh, the, 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 the better or the more data we have, the better the, this report is going to be. So. Uh, please continue to share with your, your networks um, and we look forward to, to being able to see the, the success uh, from this research that, that we've seen in, in Kenya. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so very much, Liam. Um, it's good to hear um, some of the connections that are happening, especially with human resource managers and uh, executive um, or CEOs, um, because I think that as we look at one of the areas that many LGBT persons are most um, uh, discriminated or stigmatized is within the job sector, you know, um, employment um, and understanding what jobs one can take, what are some of the um, measures that are put in place to ensure. Sometimes even if countries um, may have laws which are discriminatory, certain companies can certainly put policies within the company itself to protect this, their, their staffing. And more often than not, they don't and use the constitution as reasons why they cannot. And so it would be very interesting to see what their thinking is in, in, in terms of um, the survey and how some of those questions come about. But it will also give us ground people as to how we continue to um, push that envelope, push that gray area, um, getting persons to step up a little more than they have been before. Um, right about now, we go on to Caleb. Um, Caleb, drive us home with a little more around uh, your situation, what you have been pushing the pedals at. Um, I know you're one of those brave enough to get Billy's to even start thinking about non-discrimination, hate crime legislation kind of thing. But uh, in terms of this survey, guide us through um, your thoughts and what uh, next steps look like. For me, it's really about, can you eat? Can you pay the bills? Can you walk into a healthcare facility and they will welcome your partner? It's as simple as that. But, but what's clear is that we're in a chicken and egg situation, which comes first, the state protecting the rights of LGBT people, the private sector getting involved, or us standing up for ourselves. So a little bit of numbers. In the region, the GDP for the CARICOM member countries is $82 billion more or less. If we use a Kinsey estimate of, of 10%, it says then that one8 million LGBT people live in the Caribbean. But what does that mean in an environment that spends hundreds of millions of each, uh, dollars on HIV, but fails to protect its own citizens with anti-discrimination legislation? It means then that the state has to look at things like housing. And we learned in our population size estimate study of 2018 for Belize 
that a combined 70.3% of our people live with relatives, rent or stay with a friend, which means that they're very vulnerable to the whims of these people throwing them out of their homes. And they're very vulnerable to the economic violence that plagues them when the state does not consider the basic need of shelter as a part of its citizenship or protecting its citizens. When we look at the data around how many persons are living alone or without biological children for Belize, the data says that there's 75% of the population for men who have sex with men who have no biological children. What does that mean for the state and what does that mean for the private sector with regards to benefits it offers individuals who are from the LGBT population? Knowing that we have no social safety net, this is a poverty issue that will then be left on the burden of the state as we get older as LGBT citizens. So something has to happen, and that is we must collect data and track that data to see how we mature in our economic standing as we grow older. Moving on, what we realize is that although we have data for men who have sex with men, we don't have any data for lesbian and bisexual women. And what that means is that we don't have a picture of our full potential as productive citizens towards the economy. What do you do when you don't have a full picture of your human capital and your GDP is only $1.9 billion? Well, guess what? It's inefficient for the private sector and it's even worse for the state who is not collecting the necessary resources to provide services to all its people. That's problematic when we think about development and climate change. As we move further, we look at the region and we look at Belize and one of the things we all have in common is the weak human rights institutions. But Belize human rights report, especially for the list of responses in the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. I learned that our interim human rights institutions are the National AIDS Commission, the National the Council for Aging, and the National Con Committee for Families and Children. It's a shame to reference these institutions as human rights institutions because they don't do any civil rights enforcement. They don't address the economic concerns of LGBT populations. And I'm sure it's a similar problem across the region. We are challenged with the chicken and egg situation. Do we deal with our rights first or do we deal with economic empowerment first? I see as LGBT citizens of Caracom, we must address these two things simultaneously. And the private sector has a role to play in, advantage, in advancing these two things in our citizenship. CSOs will clearly carry the burden of driving the discussion and debate and the advocacy of intervention from an economic lens. But CSOs also carry a responsibility of moving forward with with, commun with community-led research that reflects what we need, not what the state wants. And that means we're in direct conflict with the way the state includes us in its economic planning. We're in direct conflict or invisibility with the way the private sector does not speak about us across the region. Uh, we must speak up through data. This the, this effort at data collection across the region has an opportunity to transform the way programs are developed by the state, the way the private sector speak about us as consumers and producers of goods and services, the way the international communities, specifically donors, include us in multilateral and bilateral discussion, and in the way donors look at us with regards to the us leading the way in developing additional economic research that we are concerned about. These are the changes and the transformation that has value when we envision the use of data. But now it is important for ordinary citizens to recognize their role. It is time for them to be counted and counted clearly and to show that they care about their existence 
when it comes to improving quality of life. And I'm finished. Anita, back to you. Anita, you're gone. Maybe it's- I think the key thing about this is always to find where the Zoom disappear when you go into another page. So sorry about that. I mean, Caleb, you have given us a lot of food for thought and you have gone deep into some of the statistics, which again, is always helpful to marry um, and to see exactly how things are being reported, but also what is the reality. So Caleb, a hearty thank you for taking time to really hold this down and connect the dots, national, regional, international. Folks, at this time, we just wanna be able to open the floor um, and allow you to ask Phil or Liam any questions um, you feel that you have at this time. As this survey, um, one of my first questions to you, Phil, is how long is this survey going to be um, out um, live? And how many, um, what is the samples that you're expecting from the Caribbean and how much are you expecting from that of the diaspora? Yeah, great question. So we want this to be open for the next month. Um, if you know we don't get the numbers that we're expecting, we have some flexibility to keep it open after that. But we're confident that with the work of your organizations, with all the groundwork that we're doing, with all of our partners or community partners throughout the region, that we can get to our numbers in the next month. So as per hopeful quotas, that would be 3,000 participants in the Caribbean. And again, that's 12 countries. So that's six countries from the Eastern Caribbean. It's also Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad, uh, Jamaica, Belize, Bahamas. Um, so roughly that's a few hundred per country, but again, 3000 within the region. As for the diaspora, focusing on US, UK, Canada, we're hoping for 1500. Um, and I will say that something to keep in mind that I did not bring up the first time around was that, um, something that we can hope incentivize participation is um, two Apple Watches that we have um, up for prize draw at the end. So once you complete the entire survey, you go to another form, you put in your email, et cetera, and contact information. And then toward the end of the survey, once we get to those numbers and officially close it, um, we'll do a prize draw to see for which two people who have participated and completed can get the Apple Watch Series 6. So just another thing to keep in mind, um, again, because we are ambitious in trying to get uh, this many participants, but looking at a lot of the research in the region, we're confident that we can. So looking at 3,000 persons from the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, and then 1,005 in the diaspora. Um, countries, again, is Antigua, Dominica, um, Grenada, St. Kitts, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Barbados. Uh, then you have uh, Jamaica, Trinidad. Trinidad, Suriname, Bahamas. Did I go wrong? All that's, all that's right except for um, Suriname. So we're, we're not covering Suriname, but uh, after the, the six in the Eastern Caribbean, that would also be um, Trinidad, Guyana, Jamaica, Belize, Bahamas, Barbados. Oh, okay. So questions in the chat room, um, um, Kenita. When yes, do you yes. expect to have the results by? That's from Natasha. Nastasha. When do you, ex when do yes. you expect the results, Phil? Projected. So once. Yeah, um, good question. Once we close down the survey, that will give us about um three weeks to a month to analyze all data so again that's this survey answer change we'll have to analyze that we'll have to analyze the results of the tourism survey we'll have to do a lot of qualitative coding and analysis of the interviews put that all together that'll take about a month so we're looking at um early january 2021 to kick off the new year right with some good data that speaks to economic empowerment um, whereby after that, then we really discuss with the program advisory board and a number of our community partners, what is the best way to activate this research in dissemination events? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question. Uh, you, we have 21 people in this, no, we have 25 people in this room. What's their role in, in this survey? Is it just to listen to us and look at our good looking selves? What are they supposed to do? <laughs> well, always that, <laughs> but I would say more importantly, um, fill out the survey, send it to your networks, send it to your networks um, through across the region, any of those who have left the region as part of the diaspora, send it around, send it, send it, send it. Um, just remember that the more that we get, the more we're able to have numbers that, that really speak to larger issues of socioeconomic empowerment, livelihoods, anti-poverty, human capital, um, empowerment and work, right? The more numbers we have, the more that we can go to governments, the more that we can go to the private sector and say, you have no justification to ignore this, particularly as we're going into post COVID issues and economic recovery. Like the more strength that we provide with these numbers, the, the more that we can do with it using just a number of pathways. Billy is um, disappointed. I, I'm going to shift the question. He says, why didn't you choose the Cayman? We exist too. <laughs> yeah, so that's for me, I'll jump in. Um, I'm responding to uh, from the initial funders who said that, um, who kind of mapped out what was priority for them. I would say that I wish that I could that we could be researching the entire Caribbean. So not just the English speaking Caribbean. I wish that we could also do that with Haiti, but also the Spanish speaking, including, you know, Cuba, Dominican Republic. I just, I wish that the Dutch speaking too, I wish that there was the funds to do this with every country. But I think at the end of the day, the, the somewhat unfortunate reality of LGBT related research and human rights related research is that there's only so many funds that we can, that we can rely on. Um, if you look at the a report from the government philanthropy project, GPP, looking at the sparse amount of funding for international LGBT issues in general, and then a fraction of that is for research. That's just, I think, the reality that we're in. But don't let that be a barrier to discussing how we can build in the future. I think as more of the world is expecting data-driven policies interventions, there will be more funds to follow this. And I'm hopeful that um, so many more countries and so many more communities can come together to do more research. I think, Phil, one of the things that you see also is not just that when we look at funding and you look at the amount that's to research, you also have to take a fraction of that fraction that's allocated to the Caribbean. Um, right. So we are not that high up on the agenda. If this was Africa, you'd probably get 10 times the amount. Mm -hmm. But the small islands, and the only thing that even remotely makes the islands at the moment as a place to go is because you're saying, we're not just doing one island, we're doing it across 12 islands. So there they see it as, yeah, some kind of good or, you know, some wolf will come out of it because there are multiple islands and your, and your sample size sounds reasonable to them. Um, if I could just oh. add to, um, sorry, if I could just add to the, the question that Caleb asked um, around what all of the beautiful people on this call can do. Um, and just to add on what Phil said, I think A, definitely fill out the survey, uh, B, share it with your networks. But I think most importantly, what we've seen is the value of social media to get the dissemination of this survey out. So please follow Open for Business, follow all of the, the pages of you know, all of the networks that, that you are on so that when you do see the, the ads come up or the, or the posts come up with the survey, please like, share, you know, just by liking it, we'll put that into someone else's feed um, so that they'll be able to, to promote the, um, the survey. So just one thing to add on that. And if there's anything that Phil or myself or anyone from the Open for Business team can do to support you with getting the message out to your, to your network, whether that be with creative assets or, or copy or anything like that, just please let us know and we're, we're happy to, to share that with you as well. So one of the things that we'll share is that by putting this out, and I mean, we only put it out yesterday um, when we sent out the link for persons to actually register for this meeting this morning, um, because Phil got tied up in his election, so I could blame him. There. 
Um, but we actually saw on, uh, and I knew when I sent it out, I saw Caleb share it and Kennedy share it from Outright. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've also seen Marlon on here from CBC. Um, these are the people who actually have access to networks who can amplify this. But one of the things that I saw is that on eKids Facebook page, I would have seen that this ad we sent out got 1,300 picks. However, only like 190 um, roughly engagements. Um, but I think we, that's in the last 20 hours. It's fresh, it's here. If we all share the link, Phil have just shared here, which is a direct link to this, um, and we get persons to do it now, before it becomes stale, I think this is the thing to do. So each, if, if each one of us share with, not just with our network, but we share with five friends we have on our WhatsApp group, it's, it's not even about just posting online, it's also those connections, whether it's a text, whether it's a WhatsApp, also share that, get it out there. Um, hopefully we'll tell, Phil will tell us that before the month is up, we actually got our quota and people actually complete the complete survey, um, not pieces of it, because we really need all the information. So please take the few minutes and give it um, and ensure others around you also doing it. Any last words? Alexa, Simone, Caleb, Phil, Leah? Yes. I'll give my final comment, my closing comment to it, especially to trans communities in the Caribbean. Um, the work is inclusive. You have an opportunity to raise your voice. You have an opportunity to speak. If you don't have access to a device to do the survey yourself, we will be collaborating with our partners at um, UC Trans Persons on the ground in the different countries that will be doing the survey. Someone will give you an access to a device that you can take to your community members so you can be able to fill out the survey. So I do encourage you to share it with your friends that has already traveled abroad, that's already living in the diaspora so that we can get a feedback from them as to what are some of the reasons why they chose to leave their country in order to be who they are, especially as trans people, the access to medication, the access to employment. This will give us the data that we need to show governments and decision makers that there is a group of persons that are left behind in our society. And as a citizen, no one should be left behind. Everybody should have the right to employment, the right to education, the right to access healthcare. And through this survey, you will be able to assist us with that information. Right, so. Okay. I, I just wanted thing. to add, uh -huh. Go on. Go on. <laughs> I just wanted to add um, uh, in terms of a strategy after when you've analyzed all the data, um, are we looking at some kind of regional strategy to approach government bodies or, you know, in country? Is there going to be some kind of plan around how we deal with that? So I can jump in there. Um, in terms of engaging there's a few form, I would say three types of stakeholders, right? There's private sector, public sector, and particularly ministries of finance and the economists within those ministries of finance. And then um, international organizations like the Organization of American States. Um, we have folks on the program advisor board and community partners and within each. So what's gonna be really important once we get our quotas and do all this analysis is to discuss what is the best way to activate this. And this is really important because what we don't need is another survey to sit on a hard drive or on a shelf. What we really need is to do kind of what we did in Kenya in the sense of how do we really convene? How do we have these round tables? So what's happening now is really trying to discuss, brainstorm the best way to have those round tables either separately or together to discuss, particularly in terms of post COVID, how do we um, better activate these data and in a way that speaks to better inclusive interventions as for public health plans, better data-driven interventions when it comes to employment and better data-driven interventions when it comes to policies from the government and what they can be doing to incentivize the private sector to act. I think there's so many great examples um, across the region where this is happening already um, from the level of chambers of commerce who are promoting 
you know, non-discrimination policies to governments that are overturning all sorts of laws and discussing more inclusive interventions. And it's just really tapping into that. It's really tapping into the fantastic work that your organizations and many other organizations are doing. There's so much great positive change coming. And that's why our hashtag and social media campaign, Answer Change, is trying to tap into all that positive work that is going on. So it's just a question of when we can really discuss how to activate along those um, those three buckets, those three themes. You just got put on the spot. What's next? How are you taking this forward? Simone, I love your thinking. I think that too many a times we are part of these type of surveys, we are part of these movements and we think that is gonna achieve great and then it just becomes a document on a mm -hmm. shelf, on a desk sometimes in a bin, um, never actually used. And so I like to know that taking time and energy and pushing this, that there are tangible things. And I think somewhere between Simone, Alex, I mean, Alexis and Caleb, I mean, you have people who are not gonna let you sleep still. So you and me <laughs> better know that you have a team that's gonna take you to the next, you know, the next step. Um, sure. And it's not just going to be like collect data, hoo-ha, and done. Uh, and I think for all persons who are going to invest any time and energy, uh, it is absolutely necessary to think about already when you go through these questions and you have done it, you have any ideas of how or what can be done with it, put them together. And the next call we have like this for it, um, let's, let's make it a reality, not just words on a paper. So I definitely look forward to with becoming action and data becoming life um, in a sense. <laughs> One last question for me. Um, are we getting our own country report or is this just a regional report? Throwing, building on Canitas, we're not going to let you sleep. <laughs> That's fine, don't let me sleep because I'll do the same back and say, yes, we can all do country specific reports together. That's the value of disaggregated data is that you can turn it into whatever needs to be turned into. <laughs> so whoever is there and ready <laughs> for us to write this together, just know that I'll be ready. But first and foremost, we need to get these participants. We need to get these respondents. That's so crucial to have the voices. Um, and on that note, you know, raise your voice, tell your story. Um, fill out this survey, send it to your networks. Um, I, I wanna respond to one question in there, in the chat, it said, is this available in Spanish and si claro? Uh, por favor envíeme un mensaje y vamos a hablar luego. So it's possible, just send me an email. I'll plug in my email here now. And over to anyone else who wants to jump in with a few last thoughts, um, just type in my email. So there folks, you have it. Again, we wanna, any, for any of the persons who are currently on this call, uh, is there any questions? Um, and we noticed uh, Phil kind of went around the country specific reports, but we let it pass for now until the data is out and he can tell us how many uh, responses he got per country. And maybe then that will make sense to understand which countries actually get country specific or whether it is something like, uh, Belize might definitely get a country specific if you can pull at least 500 respondents, Caleb. So we kind of put that on you. I plan to hire a couple of people. So, so, don't, so don't be handling this message. I love it. <laughs> you know, I expect the competition between between Belize and Jamaica there. So I'm not I'm not even getting in between. <laughs> I definitely one love. <laughs> one love. Same way. One love. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that's the two countries I expecting to see pull up 500 um, participants at least, you know, for the smaller countries, I would say across OECS and Barbados. That might be 500 altogether, who know? Um, <laughs> definitely folks, I don't wanna keep you any longer. I know we're already at the 11 mark. Um, it's really an honor to be able to share this space with you this morning. I know all of you have been working hard to get in this to where it is now. 
um, COVID happened, shutdowns happened, kind of had to refigure how those team meetings and taking things to the next level. And I know there are many persons who have been doing survey after survey and during COVID, it felt like sitting down behind a, a computer and people are just taking this. Um, but one thing is to um, understand how COVID impacted people and it's a lot around mental health, something that we have to be conscious of. Um, but this survey gives us an opportunity to actually fight back against government who always seem to put in a case of lack of data. And whilst I'm happy to say that whilst Open for Business is doing this survey on the socioeconomic cost of exclusion, ECAID has also taken it up where we have actually done a attitude survey across the OECS, looking at what, where are people now? What are they actually thinking about LGBT persons? And that is also coming out soon. Um, by the end of December, we should have those results in terms of, and this was carried, I think our sample size was either six to 800 um, samples per country. Um, and so we look forward to seeing that in terms of where people's attitudes are in 2020. Um, and, you know, as we continue to go, go forward, we look at how the challenges, I mean, Caribbean is small, yet we are a region that probably have seven to nine constitutional challenges happening now. So people, it's not a, it's not a dead place. Sometimes it seems like things are a bit slow or things are a bit quiet. At no time should you ever think that things are not happening. I mean, I just saw Alexis jump from one place to the next doing advocacy, um, empowerment training with trans people. I know Caleb is still on calls 24 seven and a number of you are still doing the work on the ground, having those necessary conversations. So at no time do I ever think that anyone has it light. Um, I know during COVID, it feels that we have had it even double, you know, the amount that we normally carry, but just reach out and support each other. Be nice to each other, continue to support the work. And like Simone say, one love in here, one love. If there are no last comments, no queries, then we say thank you so very much and do have a wonderful, wonderful rest of day and rest of week. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Phil. I'm here. You want me to stay on?